So we'll get started in about one minute. I see a few members online and there's a few members uh, at here as well. We'll get started in about one minute. So the, the meeting room is having some Zoom issues at the moment. So as soon as those are resolved, hopefully in a couple of minutes, we'll we'll get going. Um, mm. For what it's worth, Mr. Chair, we can hear you. And Walton is the common denominator. <laughs> okay. Feels like we were just in this room. Okay, so we're going to get started. We've got uh, uh, attendance here in the Zooms meeting, so I'll, I'll just go through the roll call to start off the meeting, and Councillor Brockington has advised that he will be unable to attend uh, today's meeting. So, Chris, over to you. Councillor Brown? Here. Councillor Curry? Here. Councillor Devine? Here. Councillor Hill? Here. Councillor Kavanaugh? Here. Councillor King? Here. Councillor Luloff? Present. Councillor Tierney? Present. Vice Chair Carr? I'm here. You have quorum, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. It sounds like we're going to have a fairly expeditious meeting, although there is one uh, major item on the agenda, which I know we'll have discussion and staff report on. I first want to just recognize uh, Ottawa and where we're meeting is located on unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. Uh, are there any declarations of interest to declare? Okay, seeing none. Well, confirmation of minutes. The minutes were issued separately, have been uploaded to the SharePoint and the eScribe portal over the past weekend. Are the minutes of the Environment and Climate Change Committee meeting of Tuesday, June 20th, 2023 confirmed? Thank you. Uh, the next is a uh, status update, Environment and Climate Change Committee inquiries and motions for the period ending September 8th, 2023. Is this item received? received. Thank you. Um, drinking water quality management system 2022 management review report and operational plan. We don't have a presentation on the item. 
Uh, if members would like, you can ask questions or if we can ask for a brief staff overview. Are there any desires to have a staff overview or questions on this item? Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, a staff overview would be good considering that we are legally responsible as councillors for drinking water in the city of Ottawa. Indeed we are. Uh, good comment. And Councillor Kavanaugh, you also have comments on this report? Okay, fantastic. Yeah, so we'll hold you. that. Okay, thanks, Councillor. We'll hold that item and we'll have staff just give a brief overview of the item and then allow for questions. And then uh, after that, we'll be holding the Solid Waste Services 2026 Residential Curbside Collection Contract. There's a staff presentation and uh, uh, it's a bigger item for our agenda. So with that, I'll, I'll ask uh, if staff are here to come up and just give a, a brief overview uh, of the Drinking Water Quality Management System 2022 review report and operational plan. So give them a moment to come up. Good morning. My name is Jen Nielsen. I'm the Director of Water Facilities and Treatment Services, and my colleague Marilyn Jerno is with me today. She's the Director of Water Linear and Customer Services, and together we're responsible for the operations of the drinking water system, um, both the facilities and the linear. Um, in terms of an overview of this report, this is required under Ontario Safe Drinking Water Act. It provides the results of the annual review of the quality management system. So the city's drinking water is like the framework for it is the drinking water quality management system. And this report that we're bringing forward today speaks to that specifically. So this is about the framework, the, doc the documentation, the processes um, that we have in place to ensure that the city and our residents get clean, safe drinking water in a consistent and reliable manner. The 2022 review found that the quality management system in place has been successful and effective. The annual external audit of the quality management system received a score of 100% for the 11th straight year. The city's drinking water systems received scores of 100% from provincial inspections and our water quality scored 100% measured against all guidelines and regulatory limits. The review also noted that staff consistently responded effectively to all incidents impacting the drinking water systems, ensuring the continuous safety of Ottawa's drinking water. The report also includes the operational plan as an attachment or as a document, I believe. And what we're seeking today is a committee's endorsement on that document. It is a living document. Um, we will be updating it continually, but what we need is endorsement from council once per term of council. And so we're bringing it forward at this time, given that this is a new term of council. We're happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much for that overview and presentation. The, we've got the documentation as well. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll open up to questions and comments from members of committee. Uh, Councillor Kavanaugh. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, and thank you very much for the report and your ongoing work. We have to be very proud of our drinking water. It is, um, as you said, 100%. And um, uh, it's really important to us um, to keep that quality. I, I, I see the plant. It's um, just down the street from me. And, um, um, and, I, and I'm very proud of it. Um, what we, we have to keep an eye on things that are continually happening. And one of my concerns is Chalk River. Um, where um, we, uh, where I moved a motion last year about this, um, and our our constant concern about um, the disposal of nuclear waste near the water's edge, um, we had conversations about this, and I just want to know if that's still being um, observed and um, monitored. Yes, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Uh, we are always in constant communication with the people at Chalk River, so we are very aware of what's going on there. We attend uh, meetings with the Ottawa River Keeper and other um, individuals who are uh, concerned with the Chalk River, so that's ongoing. And as well, we, we do uh, ongoing monitoring of our incoming water at the two plants for uh, tritium, which is uh, the the parameter of concern at Chalk River. So um, 
there are no issues with Chalk River with regards to our drinking water. And, uh, but we continue to monitor and, and be aware of all the situations that are going on upriver. I appreciate that because uh, you're, you're saying it's not a, an issue at the moment, um, but we, we need to know um, how, if things are changing and they, they will, um, we need to know um, that that is being monitored. And I appreciate that you're working with uh, the Ottawa Riverkeeper because I know that they're also um, looking into this. And, um, and again, um, my thanks for all the work you do. We can never take our drinking water for for granted, we're extremely lucky, and um, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Kavanaugh. Councillor uh, Luloff. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks again uh, for all this great work. Eleven straight years of one hundred percent is 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 pretty fantastic. Um, we've got great staff uh, doing great work every day on our behalf, and uh, I just want to express my appreciation. Um, do does staff have any concerns um, looking to the future uh, when it comes to the state of our infrastructure uh, and or otherwise uh, or are we expecting that uh, um, that this will continue on uh, into the future our continuous scores of 100 percent what are they what are the main points of, uh, of concern uh, that uh, that we should be thinking about into the future for you mr chair thank you for the question our asset management plans, which are led by the infra sorry by the asset management service, uh, speak to the situation with the, in the state of the infrastructure as well as our plans going forward. And we also have coming the infrastructure master plan, which will speak to some of the growth requirements to make sure that we're able to sustain our facilities um, and be able to support growth into the future for the long term going forward. Um, the asset management plans will be coming back again for the um, for a more fulsome review that takes into account the level of service and uh, the financial requirements that will be coming, I believe, in twenty twenty five. So it's safe to say then uh, that that staff have no concerns at this time looking to the future of our infrastructure for drinking water. Mr. Chair, that is correct. We have no concerns at this time. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Councillor Lula, for that. And yeah, glad we raised the item and to hear that overview. I was recently out with uh, the water rangers uh, who have those test kits for uh, water uh, that they distribute to communities and a lot of school testing. And we tested uh, near Brewer Pond and the, the, the testing we did any of the, the water was fantastic. So that's nice for the Rideau River this time of year because you're all concerned about blue green algae, but certainly a swimming river as well. But uh, just want to express my appreciation for staff and your work in this area. It's obviously very important and we have just some of the best water quality in the world here. So thank you for, for your work. So with that, um, the report recommendations at the Environment and Climate Change Committee recommend that Council one, receive the 2022 Management Review Report of the Drinking Water Quality Management System and two, endorse the Drinking Water Quality Management System Operational Plan. Is this item carried? Carried. Carried. Thank you. <laughs> So with that, we're gonna be moving to the Solid Waste Services 2026 Residential Curbside Collection Contract. And before uh, we dive into our agenda and discussions, uh, I'm pleased to start by uh, debuting our new green bin video, uh, which has been created by Solid Waste uh, Services. So I just wanna make sure the staff have that uh, queued up. It, it's an educational video and another tool to help explain Ottawa's uh, green bin program and the composting process. It can be found at ottawa.ca uh, forward slash waste videos along with our recycling and garbage videos. It's a great as educational tool for residents to learn more about what happens to their food waste when it's disposed of properly in the green bin. I'd, I'd really recommend um, councillors, if you can, distribute it in your newsletters because I'm sure residents would be interested to see uh, where this goes. Uh, using the green bin along with other recycling efforts is one of the easiest things people can do to help our environment. Diverting organic waste from landfill lowers the amount of methane, which contributes to greenhouse gases, and diverting organic waste helps extend the life of our landfill. The launch of this new green bin educational video comes as we approach October, which is Circular Economy Month, a month dedicated to raising awareness of and opportunities for generating less waste. Composting is the perfect example of a circular economy where food scraps are ultimately used to grow more food. I hope you enjoy, and I encourage community members to share this video. I'm not sure. Are we actually sharing the video today with each, uh, on the screen, or are we? 
let me know in the future. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you so much. Ottawa started the Green Bin program in 2010. Using your green bin continues to be one of the best ways to help our environment. Keeping organic waste out of the landfill lowers the amount of methane that is created and reduces greenhouse gases. How do we get from here to there? It starts from our homes. Whether you live in a house or multi-residential property, you can start the waste reduction process by taking the time to think about your organic waste and putting it in the green bin. After all, our city produces over 80,000 tons of organic waste from the green bin annually. That is the weight of 11,000 elephants. All food waste belongs in the green bin. This includes moldy food, banana peels, eggshells, potato peels, meat bones, grease, cooking oil, and any food scraps you will not consume. Waste collection operators collect your green bin material weekly and transport it to the organics processing facility. The organics processing facility uses technology to reduce and eliminate odors throughout the process, resulting in clean air and water vapor evaporating from the stack. Trucks are weighed once they enter the facility loaded with organics and again when they exit the facility empty. Waste is dumped in the receiving area known as the tipping floor. Then it is placed in a machine that tears apart any bags containing waste. Incoming organic material is mixed with material that has already been partially processed. Mixed material is put into a tunnel so that aerobic or with oxygen composting can take place. The accelerated aerobic composting process takes place within 7 to 14 days, depending on its mixture. Good bacteria growth is encouraged by cooking the material at 55 degrees Celsius for several days using recirculated water and air to activate the good bacteria, stimulate decomposition, and generate heat. Disease-causing microorganisms, also called pathogens, are eliminated throughout the process. The material is fed from the tunnel into another machine that screens outgoing material. Plastic bags and other non-organic waste are separated and sent to landfill. Organics that did not break down completely are reused as mixing material. What do we end up with? Alternative organic fertilizers or soil amendment products called non-agricultural source material that is rich in nutrients and improves soil quality and can also be used as animal bedding to help livestock for local farmers. Organic processing facilities must follow federal and provincial regulations and quality standards in producing outgoing materials so that they are safe and our health and environment remains protected. Learn more on how you can reduce waste and support the composting process at ottawa.ca forward slash green bin. Okay, thank you very much. That's a very cool video. And I hope uh, I do encourage members to share it uh, where possible. I think it helps uh, just encourage more use of the green bin and of course what can go in there. So um, we are gonna move to this solid waste services residential curbside collection contract now. Um, there are no delegations on this item, but we do have a, a staff presentation that we'll listen to. And then after that, we'll have questions to staff and committee discussions. So I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to staff to get set up and get us started on, on this item. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, members of committee. Today, we'll be providing you with an overview of the plan forward to procure our new curbside collection contract when the current contract expires in March 2026. You may be asking, why now? 
why is a 2026 contract up for decision in 2023? Since the pandemic, there have been added sector, sector pressures that the city has observed that have extended the time required to procure and implement a new curbside collection contract. To help ensure vendors are successful, contractors should be awarded to allow for the 24 month lead time needed to procure collection equipment prior to a contract startup. Once vehicles are ordered, implementation planning begins. In short, there's a great deal of work to be done in the lead up to issuing a new contract. As you know, solid waste is in the midst of a great deal of positive change. And there are some changes included as part of these recommendations. I'll add a quick reminder that any changes included as part of this report will not take effect until March 2026, when the new contract will be put in place. I'm joined this morning by Andrea Gay Farley, Program Manager, Program Planning, to walk you through the recommendations of the report. Next slide, please. The report we're discussing today has three distinct purposes. Approve the proposed solid waste collection service level changes, and receive an update on the procurement of the 2026 curbside collection contract. Approve the use of private landfills to divert approximately 60,000 tons of curbside garbage from the trail waste facility landfill annually over the term of the 2026 curbside collection contract. And direct staff to review the approach for the future use of private landfills, including a full cost benefit analysis and report back to council and assign the expanded zone three to the in-house group and in order to expand their mandate from solely contracted curbside collection to other activities. Convert 85 contracted positions to permanent positions starting in 2026 in order to provide more stable, flexible and permanent resources. In this presentation, we'll provide some background information to set the context for the report recommendations give an overview of the proposed service level changes to be implemented as part of the new contract, and provide an update on the plan procurement and the components of the new contract, which will require council approval, including the use of private landfills and appointing the expanded zone three and converted the contracted in-house collection group to permanent city service and resources. We'll wrap up with a quick summary and outline the next steps that will take place following council consideration of the report to begin the procurement process. I will turn the rest of the presentation over to Andrea, who will walk you through the report recommendations and next steps. Thank you, Shelby. Good morning, everyone. The current curbside collection contract was procured in 2011 through a request for tender and based on 2011 council approved service levels. These service levels include consistent service across the city, weekly green bin, including leaf and yard waste and recycling collection, and bi-weekly garbage and special consideration waste collection. The contract has been in place since October 2012 and had an original contract term of five years and has since been extended to March 29, 2026 through multiple council approved extensions, mostly to mitigate the city's risk due to the uncertainty related to the blue box transition to individual producer responsibility and to ensure uninterrupted service to our residents. The current contract valued at an average cost of approximately $53.4 million. Next slide, please. Our current contract is divided into five collection zones, three serviced by Miller Waste Services and two serviced by our in-house collections group. That, in, that in-house collection team currently consists of 103 contracted positions servicing zone three and five. Zone three was first won by a competitive procurement under a managed competition in 2005. Then in 2011, council appointed zone three to the in-house collections group due to their service record in a challenging zone. It's challenging due to its high profile, encompassing the downtown business core and the tourist area. Operationally, it is, also, it is often the most difficult zone in the city as a result of higher housing density, back alley construction, traffic congestion, high pedestrian traffic, parked vehicles, snow, reveal, snow removal operations, and road closures. City staff have been very successful in providing a high level of service despite these difficult operating conditions. In addition to being appointed Zone 3, the city also participated in a managed competition bin and won Zone 5 in 2011. And just for reference, the managed competition provides a framework for a municipal team to bid on a tender along with the private sector in a, both, in a way that's both fair and transparent. 
Next slide, please. So recommendation number one is approve the solid waste collection service level changes and receive an update on the procurement of the 2026 curbside collection contract. Next slide, please. To prepare for the new contract, our team undertook a fulsome review of the service level approved by Council in 2011. As a result of the review, residents will see no changes in 2026 to the following service. No change to the garbage and bulky item collection. It will continue bi-weekly and with the continue with the recently approved three item limit. No change to the weekly collection of organics through the green bin program. And no change to the bi-weekly collection of special consideration items on alternate weeks of garbage expanded to the non-hazardous medical waste as approved through council in July. Next slide, please. Some changes that will impact curbside residents. Staff are recommending that residents set out leaf and yard waste in a separate bag from the green bin collected on the same day. This will provide flexibility to the city to monitor the tonnage of leaf and yard waste and divert its processing to the Barnsdale compost pad located at the trail waste facility when cost effective to do so. Though this is a change for residents, it is not a reduction in service. Separate set out of the leaf and yard waste allows for flexibility to meet our requirements under the organics processing contract and at the same time, minimize our processing costs whenever possible. Schedule changes are anticipated with any new contract, and there are several reasons for this. For the next contract, staff are proposing to shift from a five-day to a four-day collection week, Monday through Thursday. This will eliminate Saturday push days, which will in turn lead to higher resident satisfaction. We also expect to see other benefits, such as higher employee retention with a four-day work week. Second, Current schedules can also be impacted by vendors as vendors work to create routes, of, routes to maximize collection efficiencies. Staff will continue to stress as part of the RFP requirements that schedule changes should be minimized wherever possible. And I'd like to take a moment here to remind you that we continue to manage the risk of separate collection days of the blue and black box material starting in 2026. We first highlighted this risk through our blue box IPR reports and we continue to work with circular materials and their proposed and their preferred vendor to align these collection days in 2026. Next slide, please. We're also making a change to the collection zones. The current five collection zones are to be rebalanced and consolidated into three larger collection zones to increase operational efficiencies, reduce cost, and ensure daily service levels are met over the term of the contract. This is consistent for other areas of service in the city and through our municipal scan. For residents and councillors, we have eliminated the six ward divisions where there were two contractors in one ward, meaning that have existed with the current contract. Next slide, please. Recommendations two and three focus on the use of private landfills. The use of private landfills and the redirection of some curbside residential garbage was first identified as an opportunity as part of the work on the solid waste master plan goals. That is to help preserve and extend the life of the trail waste facility landfill. In 2021, council directed staff through the residual waste management strategy to look at the use of private landfills ahead of the next curbside collection contract. Recommendations two and three ask council to approve the use of private landfills to divert up to 60,000 tons of waste from the trail waste facility annually over the life of the contract and then direct staff to review the approach for the future use of landfills, including a full cost benefit analysis and report back to council. Next slide, please. I'd like to start the use of private, uh, the discussion of private landfills with the statement that both private and municipal landfills are regulated by the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. There are two suitable privately owned and operated landfills or transfer stations available within the city that are approved to accept residential garbage. They are the West Carlton Environmental Center on Carp Road and the combination of GFL's transfer station in the East End and the GFL Moose Creek landfill. By using private landfills in the West and the East End, waste, waste can be processed closer to where it is collected, increasing collection efficiency by reducing the number of kilometers traveled, which in turn reduces fuel costs as opposed to hauling it all to the trail waste facility landfill. There will be a tip fee associated with the placement of garbage at private landfills, which will be offset by operational efficiencies, fuel savings, and extending the life of the trail waste facility landfill. By diverting this waste, there is a potential for extending the life of the landfill for up to two years based on current operational practices and diversion rates. Any increase in diversion rates will increase the length of time the landfill is extended. Next slide, please. 
I'd like to go a little bit over the legislative framework that landfills have to comply with. The legislative framework that regulates landfills prescribes comprehensive standards for design, operation, closure, and post-closure care. The standards covers issues such as groundwater and surface water protection, landfill gas and leachate control, noise mitigation, and a minimum buffer area. Waste management projects, including opening and expanding landfills, must meet extensive environmental assessment requirements to ensure the protection, conservation, and wise management of our environment. Both private and municipal run landfill sites are governed by the same regulation and environmental standards. There are several advantages to diverting garbage to these private landfills, and they include the avoidance of hauling garbage at least 3,700 kilometers, which is equivalent to a full garbage truck traveling from Ottawa to Calgary each year. The potential to minimize collection cost increases by creating opportunities for route optimizations and reducing fuel use by reducing trucking traffic. Not only is garbage being collected closer to where it is processed, but the return to service distance for the vehicles can be optimized as well. And it has the opportunity to preserve at least two years of landfill space over the life of the contract, assuming current diversion rates. This represents a savings of $6 million in asset value each year. Next slide, please. I'd like to move into recommendations four and five, which is expand the expand, sorry, assign the expanded zone three to the in-house collections group for curbside collection and direct staff to consult with QP Local 503 with respect to the terms and conditions of hiring workers in the in-house collections group in order to implement a permanent in-house collections group. Next slide, please. As part of the preparation for the procurement of the new contract, staff reviewed service requirements in each zone and identified the in-house collections group as an opportunity to make changes to offer more reliable, consistent service while mitigating financial and operational risks to the city. This opportunity was driven by several factors, including staff turnover, increasing vehicle maintenance costs by maintaining vehicles to a collection term, preserving the knowledge and expertise in zone three, and be able to continue to drive a competitive environment for curbside waste collection. Three options were reviewed as part of this. Maintaining the status quo of appointing zone three to the in-house group and having contracted services for the rest of the city. The second option was eliminating the in-house collections group and having service provided solely by the private sector. And the third option, which is being recommended is a hybrid approach where the in-house group becomes permanent to the city and the other two zones are serviced by the private sector. The current in-house collection group was, well, sorry, the current in-house collections group was consulted during the review and the, and the formation of these recommendations. And we have had several discussions with the union as the recommendations were developed. In order to convert the in-house collections group, staff require council direction to consult with QP 503 to ensure that the jobs to be posted will be in accordance with terms and conditions of a collective agreement. Next slide, please. Let's talk about some of the advantages of a permanent in-house collections group. A permanent in-house collection group offers more stability and staff retention and offers experience to provide collection in a historically challenging zone. It also serves to lower the cost of hiring and onboarding activities and pro provides additional opportunities for progression within the city, maintaining the knowledge and experience in the city. This option offers increased flexibility in waste collections outside of a collection contract and operational nimbleness to address, the, to address and back up other collection activities, such as responding to emergencies or the ability to step in should we have issues with contracted vendors. A permanent in-house collection group provides opportunities to pilot innovative technologies or methods in waste collection, as will be identified as part of the solid waste master plan, and will provide a proof of concept in advance of the next curbside collection contract. An expanded scope of work for a permanent in-house collections group will allow for collection of recycling from city facilities once the common collection system is started in January 2026 under the provincial blue box program. Just a reminder here that city facilities are not eligible for collection under that, pro under that program. A blend of in-house and contracted services removes the need for a managed competition process while allowing the other two zones to be cured using the RFP. While maintaining a competitive environment in terms of cost and performance as private sector bids can be compared against municipal operational data. It also allows the city to manage operational financial risk and provides flexibility for the curbside collection system to adapt to changes. Next slide, please. So what are we expecting in terms of the RFP? A municipal scan of recent waste contracts indicates new contracts have experienced a significant range in contract pri price increases, 
largely due to fuel costs and equipment and labor increases and market instability because of the pandemic and IPR. The benefit of issuing an RFP to procure a new contract is that price increases are easier to mitigate as vendors are leveraging their experience and knowledge to fulfill a detailed set of city requirements. Establishing agreements with the private landfills is estimated across approximately $8 million annually, subject to final negotiations and beginning in 2026. This is offset both by representing an estimated $6 million in savings annually in asset value by preserving the airspace at Trail Road Waste Facility over the term of the contract, and efficiencies being realized in contract pricing with more efficient routing and less fuel consumption. Establishing the in-house collections group permanently would require the conversion of 85 FTEs beginning in 2026. In order to acquire, as I said before, in order to acquire the new collection staff as described, staff require council's direction to consult with QP 503 to ensure the jobs are posted will be in accordance with the terms and conditions of the collective agreement. These consultations would begin as soon as council had, a, as soon as council gave us approval. Solid waste service expects to see efficiencies in expanding the scope of the in-house service reducing higher than normal maintenance costs of maintaining vehicles through the life of the contract and reducing the need for higher emergency funding needed by using external vendors in emergency cleanup activities. Next slide, please. I'm sure you guys will all be very happy to see this slide has been cleaned up and not a wall of text. Um, so services that have no change to residents, uh, biweekly garbage and bulky item collection, weekly grim bin collection, biweekly special consideration collection, bi-weekly yellow bag for small businesses, and weekly grievance and school collection. Where we will see potential changes for residents are the collection schedule. We may see some schedule impacts. We will now be switching to a week weekly leaf and yard waste set out with the green bin, and blue and black box collection will come off our collection roster as it moves to circular materials. Next slide, please. Last slide. This is what the next few months will look like upon council approval. So just a reminder here, Shelly mentioned at the beginning, any changes proposed uh, through this report would not start until Q2 2026 at the start of the contract. Pending council approval, staff will work to finalize and issue the RFP in Q4 of this year to ensure the procurement process is completed with contracts awarded to the vendors in Q1 next year, allowing sufficient time for equipment procurement and contract startup activities. Staff will begin to work on a detailed communications plan the outreach will begin mid-2025 and continue through the start of the contract in March 2026. Staff will work with council members to develop messaging for their use in newsletter and other engagement tools. Upon the approval of the use of private landfills, staff will include details on the use of private landfills within the RFP. Staff will also begin to finalize agreements with waste management and GFL to begin receiving garbage in 2026. And lastly, upon approval of a permanent in-house collections group, Staff would begin work immediately on an implementation plan, including fleet requirements for converting to a permanent workforce in 2026. Capital budget considerations will be brought forward as part of both the 2024 and 2025 budgets to have enough time to replace vehicles as needed and to ensure a smooth transition to the newly expanded Zone 3 and servicing city facilities. And as mentioned above, staff will continue working with QP 503 in order to convert the collection staff as described in the report. Next slide. So I want to thank you very much for having us present today and look forward to your questions. Okay, thank you very much for that presentation and for the work on this report. I know it's been ongoing for some time now, so appreciate all your efforts. Uh, I will open it up. There are no delegations on this item. Um, I'm going to open it up to committee members for any comments or questions. There's a number of recommendations in front of us um, and uh, some zone changes compared to where we were in the past. So. Uh, Councillor Cavanaugh, and then Vice Chair Carr. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for giving us a briefing ahead of time. I just want to clarify, um, blue and box uh, pickup, um, you had it in the change. Is that mean it's going to be uh, not bi-weekly anymore? For you, Chair, thank you very much for the question. Um, what I meant by a change for the city is that we'll no longer be collecting it. Um, we don't know the collection schedule in 2026, but I, so I can say we don't know the collection schedule in 2026. We know our program is very successful and can make the assumption they will continue weekly black blocks, weekly blue box, but we do not know that yet. As soon as we do, we will communicate to council. Okay, so 
so that it could, all right. Um, anyway, I just wanted to say um, in terms of the contracts um, that have, we, it has been improved. I was telling you this, that um, we have less complaints, um, the, the efficiencies and I appreciate the four day work week might, might solve these problems because it's always that extra day after a long weekend where somebody gets missed. So um, I appreciate that that change. I'm assuming it's a longer work day um, that they're working the same number of hours, but they're working what 12 hour shifts uh, for four days or whatever, um, 10 hour days. Yes, Council. Yes. Yeah. They're working longer days. Yeah. Yeah, they work longer days, but for four days. And uh, and hopefully that that is um, possible because it's hard work. We know that. Uh, we've already been told they run marathons every day um, or half marathon. So um, hopefully that will be will be doable. Um, has it been a problem to get uh, staffing? Has it been has it been a labor shortage? Sure, you chair. Thank you for the question. So currently the in-house team works a 10 hour day. Uh, so four tens, even though our collection is over five days. Uh, we do see that as being a benefit, so it allows uh, all staff and contractors that extra day of rest. So working hard for those four days, and then on the fifth day, they have that rest and also for vehicle maintenance. So we anticipate that this will be a benefit um, when the industry receives our RFP. Thank you. Um, with the use of the private um, uh, sites for, uh, rather than just using Trail Road, um, I, I, I just feel like we're, we're just, uh, we're, we're trying to get things away from trail road because, um, uh, we know that it, the capacity is, is limited and, um, but it feels kind of like a cheat cause we're, we're still dumping stuff and we're not reducing. Um, so I just want to make sure that that's not put in the spin that, um, that we've reduced, um, consumption because we're still using um, dump sites. So um, I, I, that, that was my concern when I, when you were telling me, telling us about uh, the private sites. So I recognize that you're doing it because of efficiency for um, how far the trucks have to go and they happen to be closer to different parts of our huge city. Um, but um, we're going to continue to report that um, this is how much garbage people put out and that we're not just looking at trail road. Thank you, Councilor, for that, Drew Chair. Um, it, uh, very good points. Um, we are going to continue. So let me answer the first question, last question first. Yes, we are going to continue to report out total tonnages provided by the city, whether it's still diverted to private landfill or, to, or whether or not it comes to trail. What I would also like to uh, assure you, if I may, is that the solid waste master plan is coming. You are all getting briefings now about stage one and two, and know that the final or the draft will be coming forward this fall. So we are pushing full ahead on all our diversion activities, all our activities that follow the, hi the waste hierarchy. So the goal of using private landfills is not to create more space for us to deliver garbage, but to allow time to make the, the big decisions that you have to wait to the, make through the master plan and give us the space to be able to make those decisions. Okay, thank you. I'll let my colleagues ask questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kavanaugh, Vice Chair Carr. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. I just um, wanted to confirm my understanding. So we're proceeding with the renewal of the curbside um, con con contracts for 2026. So does that mean in the context of the solid waste discussions that we're gonna be having over the next a uh, little bit next few months, that there would be no opportunity to discuss a, sort of a change in model, like for example, moving to a utility model for garbage until after this contract is completed, like another eight years or so. Like if you wanted to move to a utility model with like a, a cart system or something like that, would that no longer be an option? Does that make sense? So, uh, through you, Chair, I'll start to answer the question and then Shelley can add on to it when I miss it. Um, so the contract is set up, the contract, the RFP and the contract will be set up in such a way that has change mandate clauses to allow us to address anything that you approve in the short term of the solid waste master plan. So uh, it, we developed these recommendations and the RFP in, consulta in consultation with the solid waste master plan team. 
So we wanna make sure we protect for whatever you might choose to do curbside collection wise in the short term. Um, specific to carts, we are not anticipating carts in this collection contract, but it would be something we could use the in-house group to, try to test as a proof of concept to know how to best roll it out um, to a full curbside collection program into, after the next collection for the next collection contract. So not in 2026, but the next one. So the idea is the, of the in-house, so I blended two concepts there, but the idea of that in-house group is to be able to pilot some of these bigger changes to ensure we're successful as we roll it out across the city. <laughs> okay, thanks. So if any changes were contemplated to the green bin program as well, uh, that that would could be um, leveraged throughout the, the contract as well. Like, should we choose to make changes to that contract, for example? Through you, Chair, the change management clauses will allow us to make changes. There may be a cost impact with making big changes. For example, if we're going somewhere other than Convertis, if we're going far east end of the city, there may be some trucking implications that we'll have to negotiate, but the change management clauses allow us to do that. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, Vice Chair Carr. Councillor Devine. Thank you, Chair. Um, so before I thank the two of you for being in the positions you are, um, I forgot to thank uh, Jen and Marilyn earlier. Um, I'm, I'm really, really proud and grateful that we have uh, people taking on such stinky roles awesome, often. Um, but uh, um, from, from the briefing I had from you earlier and from, from the briefings I've had over the last uh, several months, uh, I'm really grateful that you're in these positions as 100% um, drinking water people too, as, as well. So thank you very much for this. Um, I really thoroughly did appreciate the briefing you gave me, um, my, my, my staff and I, several months ago. And I am very, uh, quite generally supportive of these recommendations. I just want to zero in on a few things just for clarity and not so much really out of concern. Um, with regards to uh, diverting 60,000 uh, tons per year to private landfill, so just, uh, and I do appreciate the way in which you uh, illustrated the cost savings, 6 million per year from not having that tonnage go to trail, um, a lot of savings in terms of not having to drive back and forth the trail, the equivalent of driving to Calgary and back. Um, can I assume that, cause I don't, forgive me, I don't know if we pay, the city pays tipping fees to trail. I assume we don't, we own trail, um, but we will certainly be paying tipping fees to private landfill. Can I assume that any new costs of tipping fees to private landfill are greatly offset, if not balanced out by the cost savings we accumulate by not dumping in the trail? Thank you for the question for you, Chair. Um, we can assume that there will be an offset. The degree of offset, we won't know until the bids come in. So we won't know right. the impact of be, it being able them to route closer and the fuel consumption and the vehicle um, preservation. We don't yep. know the impact of that until we see the bids come in. And without the specifics of those bids, can we, because there are, um, can we at least assume that the difference between diverting 60,000 away from trail and keeping a trail, can we at least assume as their preliminary examination to assume that this is at least cost neutral in terms of balancing scenario A versus scenario B? Thank you, uh, through you, Chair. Thank you for the question. I think we can assume that with the removal of blue and black box and the use of private landfills, that we are minimizing as much as possible collection cost increases. Okay. So what that will look like, we won't know until we see the bids, but those two factors will greatly help any increases we might see. Okay. Um, similar to my colleague, Councillor Kavanaugh's line of inquiry, um, my overall concern is not so much that we're, my overall concern, as, as I know is yours, is that we just increase our diversion rate in general. And I don't want anyone to think that by moving 60,000 per year to private, we're, we're still producing X plus 60,000 tons per year. It's like when my kids say they clean the room and I open the closet, oh, no, you didn't. It's all in the closet. So what I just want to be sure of is that by diverting 60,000 tons per year to private landfill, Will we still have this, and forgive me if it's a dumb question, will we still have the same capacity to measure whether or not we are increasing our overall diversion rate away from landfill, whether it's trail or private? For you, Chair, thank you for the question. Again, great question. Tonnages will be reported as they are today. 
So we may show you this much garbage went to West Carlton, this much garbage went to GFL, this much garbage came to trail. Here is the total garbage that the city of Ottawa residents created, or this much came from multi-res. You know, whatever, how we're reporting it now is how you should expect to see it, if not better, moving forward. And those measurements will come forward as part of the solid waste master plan discussion. What are the measurements you want to see on a regular basis and what does that look like? But even though we're sending waste to different landfills, that's still all residential waste and we'll be reporting out on that. It doesn't disappear from us. It, it's still reported out on. Thank you. Um, and then, so just, yeah. oh, sorry. Sorry, I'll just add on to that, that I think it's it's really important that we're reporting on our diversion increases. So that'll be another key measure. So through uh, bringing forward the master plan, coming back to some annual reporting so that there will be, in addition to the visibility of what waste is going where, the composition of that waste will be reported on a regular basis. So then that way we can be adjusting our tactics in order to increase diversion if we're finding things are, are, are stalling. Thank you. Um, and then just to, lastly, to wrap up, I'm really um, um, excited by the initiative you're taking with um, moving those uh, 85 personnel into FTEs for, for, many, num for many reasons. Um, not only do I think that this is going to provide us with some um, operational savings over the long term, but I'm really, really excited by, and you've clearly laid this out, the operational nimbleness that this is going to provide the city with and certainly public works with um, and whether that's in the ability to deploy personnel in the case of an emergency or to make up for disruptions caused by sorry to make up for gaps caused by service disruptions with other vendors um, we all hear time and time again that our, our resources are depleted and we just don't have enough x y and z to attack it and i think that the kind of initiative you're showing here is a nice direction moving against the the direction that the market had been taking for decades and decades. And so I think this is going to provide us with more tools and more stability um, over all the long term. And I appreciate the leadership that Public Works is taking on this. You've got my support. Thank you very much for that, uh, Councillor Devine. I, I think I saw Councillor Luloff's hand up, but maybe it was down again. Uh, Councillor King. Uh, thank you so much, Chair, and uh, thank you so much for the work that's been undertaken, for the briefings that our offices have uh, received, uh, and uh, the the in-depth um, analysis that you've provided in terms of uh, the way to go forward. Um, my question just really revolves around education and ensuring that um, there's adequate education uh, for residents to understand the changes that are going to uh, be uh, recommended. So I'm just wondering if you could speak to uh, some of the approaches you're going to take to resident education, talking about uh, the, the changes to uh, solid uh, waste operations. For you, Chair, thank you, Council, for the question. Um, we'll uh, lean heavily on our colleagues in the long-term planning team as part of the Solid Waste Master Plan. They've developed a very robust uh, communications and outreach uh, program and we'll work with them to develop the tools that you need to communicate to your residents for changes and then specific communication to residents that are seeing schedule changes. So we've been in this contract since 2011. People are very comfortable with their Thursday collection days. So if they're seeing a collection day schedule, they will be very specific and very much, uh, I dare say, door-to-door -door type communication that goes for schedule changes. Um, that will be very important for us. And then it will be all hands on deck, including all of us in those first couple of weeks of collection schedule as, as we onboard the new contract. So getting out with residents, being on the road, being able to help with our inspectors and, and, and communicating changes to residents as we need. Um, so we very much realize that this is a new collection contract for us and we haven't done a new curbside collection contract in a while. Um, so the, the plan is looking forward to 2025, starting that communication early, often, and then ramping it up as we head towards the start date. No, excellent. I appreciate that um, um, answer and the, the fact that we are um, giving a lot of forethought to that because um, a lot of people ultimately will be caught flat-footed, as we know, um, who might not be uh, receptive or receiving um, 
communication uh, from the city. So we really need to, to emphasize that. I know that um, our respective uh, councillor offices uh, will obviously be trying to get out that message as well. Uh, but I uh, appreciate that that focus and that emphasis on, on education. I think it will be very important for the rollout of the program. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor King. Any other questions or comments from councillors on committee? I'm not seeing any thank you to the team for your work here. So I'll just ask if the report recommendations uh, for the solid waste services 2026 residential curbside collection contract are carried. Carried. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Um, we're moving on. There are no in-camera items for today. Uh, we see the information previously distributed on the agenda. Are there any uh, notices of motion? Uh, are there any inquiries? Okay, seeing none, I do, I'll just, uh, with committee members' uh, indulgence, uh, I do have a motion to add the uh, Service Line Warranties of Canada program to our next agenda, but to do that, I need two-thirds of uh, committee to approve that the, that the following motion be added to the agenda pursuant to subsection 89.3 of the procedure bylaw. Can we carry that onto the agenda for today? Thank you very much. Thanks very much. So um, the the motion and actually uh, Vice Chair Carl step out of the, the chair's position and, and allow you to chair as I read in the motion. Mr. Chair. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, Councillor Curry. Sorry, I realize we've already voted to include it, but we didn't see the motion for what we were adding, like to see it before we even voted to include it. That's that's correct. Yeah, it's on it's on uh, to add the service line warranties of Canada program to the next agenda item. Uh, so I just shortened it up, but I that the the, um, the motion is in front of us uh, now, um, and happy to work through it with you. Uh, now I can I can read through it if you'd like. It was just to add the motion on the agenda to the, for consideration today. So it's not for uh, we haven't approved it yet, but it's to consider it today. So we've we've resolved to consider it today. And so I'll read through the motion, um, ask Councillor Carr to, to chair. Uh, whereas the city of Ottawa- chair. Oh, sorry. Yes, Councillor Curry. Just totally on process though. Like, but before we voted to include a motion, it would have been nice to see what the motion is that we're adding to asking to include, you know, to like, if we're going to add longer, this meeting to be longer, it would have been good to know what the motion was. So maybe we could have had it up before we voted to extend the meeting. But anyway, sure. yeah, no, I was trying to just be short with it in terms of adding, like to, to explain what it was. Sometimes I've seen it explained in short form as I've done. Sometimes I've seen the entire motion put up. Normally, uh, there's a request to add a motion with two thirds and then we read through the motion. So uh, appreciate that feedback. Um, so the, the motion on the floor now is that whereas the city of Ottawa has entered into an agreement with service line warranties of Canada to offer Ottawa homeowners protection plans to help cover repair costs associated with their portion of water service and sewer septic lines. And whereas there have been no opportunities for the environment and climate change committee to discuss this ongoing program and ask questions of staff during this term of council and whereas the committee chair is requesting that staff be available at the October 17th meeting of the environment and climate change committee to answer questions from members of committee on the current status of the service line warranties of Canada program. Therefore, be it resolved that the Environment and Climate Change Committee discuss the service line warranties of Canada program at its meeting of October 17th, 2023, and staff be authorized to provide a verbal update to committee on the current status of the program. So I'll ask if there's any questions or comments about the motion. What all we're doing is adding an agenda item to the next meeting for discussion. Carried. Councillor Curry. Just can we have a staff comment? Are they available? Do they uh, have any other plan to inform us of anything on this other than at a meeting? I'll ask uh, the clerk's office to comment or Tammy Rose. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Chair, we're we're happy to come back to uh, to the next meeting and to provide a, a verbal update. We can accommodate that. Okay, thank you for that. Thanks very much. Any other questions or comments from? Oh, my apologies. Vice Chair Carr. I was trying to. <laughs> Any other comments? Is the item carried? Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Vice Chair. Um, there is, I did actually have a, a notice of motion. It's a small motion about a commemorative tree that I will put on the agenda now as well. And I just wanna make sure we've got it up 
um, on this. Okay, okay. Um, I don't think we have it. Maybe I will come back to it then. <laughs> I'll come back to it uh, uh, at council instead, I guess, or another next committee meeting. So, uh, okay. So uh, any other business? Seeing none. Okay, we are adjourned. Our next meeting will be held on Tuesday, October 17th, 2023. We'll see you then. Thank you, everybody.